Well, let's come to the Word of God this evening, and we're coming to the book of Genesis, please, and chapter 11, the book of Genesis, chapter 11. I want to thank our brother George very much for, first of all, the invitation to come and share with you here in Kilkeel, and again for his kind words of welcome this evening. It's good to be here. I hope you don't have Wilson fatigue after having one yesterday and another one today. But, well, you've kept the best to the last, isn't that right? The first shall be last. And if he was here, he would say the same thing. So it's good to be here, and it's good to come uh, to the Word of God this evening. George has asked me over these few nights just to look at some uh, prophetic scriptures, and that's what we intend to do beginning tonight at Globalization. And over the remainder of the week, God willing, we uh, want to look at anti-Semitism tomorrow night. Uh, I, I was just reading today that in 2014, we haven't figures more up to date than that, but, but in the United Kingdom, there were more recorded acts of anti-Semitism than any other year. We know from our own country, we know that Jewish graves were even uh, desecrated in Belfast. We know there's one of our own, uh, one of these super councils has said they don't want to buy any goods uh, from Israel, uh, but when they were asked to give over their iPads, they just weren't that keen. Uh, but there's a lot of anti-Semitism which goes a lot deeper than that. And we want to look at the Word of God and see the root cause of anti-Semitism. And I believe as we see it rise, not only in the United Kingdom, but indeed throughout Europe and the rest of the world, I believe it's an indication again that Jesus Christ is coming soon. On Wednesday night, we want to look at travel and how travel has changed over the centuries. And again, there's a little verse of Scripture tucked away in Daniel's prophecy that tells us this was going to happen, and we want to look at that and some of the other uh, scriptures around that passage in Daniel. When we come to Thursday night, God willing, I'm going to look at the days of Lot. And of course, we know what the overriding sin was in the days of Lot, the sin of homosexuality. It's very topical, very topical today because of what has happened in the Isher's case. Uh, it's very topical all the time where living in changing times. And of course, the people of God need to be aware of what's going on, but I believe, and again, we'll see it from Scripture, I believe it's an indication again that we're in the last of the last days. And I do believe that Jesus is coming, and coming very soon. And Friday night, strange subject for a prophetic meeting. Uh, I've called it the tattoo craze. And uh, I don't know why you know it or not, but uh, tattoos and body art has really taken off. Uh, especially among women. Uh, tattoo parlors say now that most of those who come in, over 50% are ladies, particularly we age between 22 up to 45, and we're living in a society that's gone tattoo mad. Uh, is there any prophetic significance? Has the Scripture anything to say about body art and about tattoos in general? Is there any indication from Scripture? And again, uh, please invite others in along uh, just to see what the Word of God has to say on these various subjects. That's all we want to do. We just want to spend time in the Word of God and to look and delve deeper into Scriptures. I've tried to select some topics perhaps that are different than maybe you've heard before. And we trust that you'll be blessed and encouraged, and we do trust you'll use the opportunity to bring others in to the meetings. And when it comes to looking at prophetic Scriptures, it's a very easy step to apply it in the gospel, isn't it? because there's that truth that's contained throughout all of the messages that our Lord Jesus is coming, and the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. And night by night, we'll be making that gospel application. If your friends are not saved, you can bring them in, and you can be sure that they'll be told that they need to be born again, and they need to get right with the Lord. So let's come to Genesis chapter 11, and we'll read from verse number 1, please. Genesis chapter 11, and we're reading from verse number 1. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick, and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. 
And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do. Now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to. Let us go down and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. And we do trust the Lord will bless the public reading of His own precious and fallible and errant and inspired word to our hearts this evening. Back in July time, I'd been over in the United States for a holiday, uh, just like George over in Florida. Uh, only he was there early in the year. He went at the cheap time. Uh, I went at the more expensive time. And so I was over in, in Florida in the United States. And when I was in the United States, there was a, there was a craze that had just taken off, Pokemon. Uh, and now you, some of you may know something about Pokemon. If you know nothing about Pokemon, join the club. Uh, but my wee lad was into Pokemon, and he had uh, following this very closely. It was released in the United States, and it, it really uh, took off. But not only was it released in the United States, it was released in Australia, New Zealand, uh, in the 6th of July, 2016. Then on the 13th of July, it was released in Germany, the United Kingdom, on July the 14th, Italy, Spain, Portugal on July the 15th, July the 16th, it came to Austria, Belgium, Bulgaria, Croatia, Cyprus, the Czech Republic, Denmark, Estonia, Finland, Greece, Greenland, Hungary, Iceland, Ireland, Latvia, Lithuania, Luxembourg, Malta, Netherlands, Norway, Poland, Romania, Slovakia, Slovenia, Sweden, Switzerland, then in Canada, then Puerto Rico, and so on and so forth. It became a worldwide phenomenon. And the thing that struck me, I remember just thinking about it, in the United States, some of the shops were offering discounts if you happened to catch some of these Pokemon. And when we come back to the United Kingdom, the craze was also here in the United Kingdom. As I said, I'm no expert. My youngest was a bit of an expert, and he told me that every church had a Poco stop. Don't know what that is. Don't know what it is. Not only the churches, but the chapels and the orange halls and the AOH halls all had these different Poco stops and Poco gyms on all these sort of things. And so this was going on, but the thing that caught my attention was the fact that it was worldwide, worldwide. Something that began in the United States in July, and within a few days it had just spread right throughout the whole world. And it just reminded me how small the world has become. We hear people talk about the global village. We hear people talk about global governance. And uh, I'm sure you have seen, even in your lifetime, how, how the world has become so small. And really, that's what we want to think about this evening, globalization. What is the prophetic significance of any? What has the Word of God got to say about it? Let me give you a, a, an academic, if you like, definition. Uh, globalization is the national geopolitical policy in which the entire world is regarded as the appropriate sphere for a state's influence. The development of social, cultural, technological, or economic networks that transcend national boundaries, globalization. As I say, we talk about the global village. Uh, we see the world sometimes as one uh, big country, one big village, if you like. What happens in a faraway place now affects us. Used to be what happened in Kilkeel, may affect people in County Down. Uh, but now if something happens here, it can affect people in other places. Something happens in the United States, it can affect people here, even in County Down, because we live in such a small world. We have global products now, like Coca-Cola. We have uh, global companies like McDonald's. We have global brands like Manchester United is a global brand. Real Madrid is a global brand. We have global problems like global warming, global terrorism. We'll say a little bit more about that in a few moments' time. Uh, and so we get the impression that the world is becoming a smaller place. And we really do live in a very small world. We have the World Health Organization. There is a group called the Bilderberg Group. You can read about it on Wikipedia. It's a group that meets once a year. It's got about 150, 100 to 150 members. They meet in secret. 
Uh, and these are people from all over the world, and they come and they gather in secret. And Dennis Healy was a member of this group. Some of you will remember Dennis Healy, the Labour uh, politician. Uh, and he said to, to say that we are pushing for one world government is, is an exaggeration, but it's not an unfair thing. He said it's not an unfair comment. And throughout the world, we have a push for a one-world government. We have the World Health Organization. We have the G8. We have the G20. And many of these political leaders see the world just as one parish. Globalization. Is there any prophetic significance tonight? Well, let's begin in Genesis chapter 9. If you're still in Genesis 11, just flick back over a couple of passages to Genesis chapter 9. I want to talk first of all about the tar. You'll know the, the story in Genesis, how that uh, Noah came out of the ark with his wife and his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and God gave them a specific command in Genesis 9, verse 1. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, and here's God's word to them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. The world had been destroyed in a worldwide flood. God says, your job now is to be fruitful, to multiply, and to replenish the earth. Uh, through procreation, we want you to repopulate the earth. This was God's plan. And God wanted them to spread throughout the world, uh, that the world would become populated again with people. Now come to Genesis chapter 10. Do we see how this worked out? Remember, we have Shem, we have Ham, and we have Japheth, we have the three sons of Noah, uh, and they're going to move out, uh, and their families would have families and more families, uh, and then the earth would be populated eventually. That's how God had planned it, and that's how it's going to work out, because God's ways always comes to pass. But look at Genesis 10, verse 1. And these are the generation of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and unto them were sons born after the flood. And so you can see uh, the scene is set for these three sons and their wives and their families to populate the earth. Now look at verse 2. The sons of Japheth, we begin with Gapheth, and then we have some names here, Gomer and Magog, Madai, Java, and Tubal, Meshach, and Tyrus. Don't be worrying about the names. If you read down through, you'll discover there are 14 nations that come from Japheth. Then look at verse number 5. By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands. Everyone after his tongue just gets that phrase, his tongue, their families, and their nations. This is how God wanted it to be. Uh, they were divided in their tongues and in their languages and in different nations, and this is how God intended it to be. That's Japheth. Then move down to Ham, verse number 6. And the sons of Ham, Cush, Mizraim, Phut, and Canaan. Again, don't worry about the names. And when you look at Ham, you have 30 nations that come from Ham. Now glance down to verse number 20. These are the sons of Ham after their families. Notice again their tongues, their countries, their nations. And you can see how they're divided. And so they've spread out. They've become uh, tongues and nations and countries. Now let's move on to Shem, verse 21. I'm doing this quickly, but I just want to set the scene for chapter 11. Verse 21, unto Shem, so we have Japheth, we have Ham, and then we come to Shem. Unto Shem also, the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth, the elder, even to him were children born. And so here we have 26 nations that come from Shem, and you have them recorded in Genesis 10. Now look down to verse 31. These are the sons of Shem after their families, after their tongues, in their lands, after their nations. So you can see God's plan is being fulfilled. He wanted these three sons and their wives to repopulate the earth and to spread out throughout the earth, and they would become different nations and different countries and different places. That's exactly what God said would happen. Did it run smoothly? Look at verse number 25 in Genesis 10. You get a little hint here that it didn't run smoothly. And unto Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days was the earth divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. Now, Peleg is a strange name to give a child. It means uh, divided. Not a, not a name that you would want to give a child. But there's a little hint at the end of the verse there. It says, in his days was the earth divided. Something happened during his time, and the earth was divided. God had to step in. And God stepped in and divided the earth, and they were scattered abroad. Now what happened? That's what we have in Genesis chapter 11. 
Look at Genesis chapter 11, verse number 1. If you like, Genesis 11 looks back. It's a flashback to what has taken place in Genesis 10. Genesis 10, you have how God worked it out. Genesis 11, you see a problem that God had to deal with that it would be worked out. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. Now, that's what you'd expect. Coming out of the ark, you have Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and you'd expect them to have the same tongue and the same language. Verse 2. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Shinar is Babylon. It's modern-day Iraq. It's, it's a name that will come up often in Scripture. Verse 3. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. See the word us there. Go to, let us. It means for ourselves. And so here's the people, and they're together, and they're doing something for themselves. They're doing something out of self-interest, nothing to do with God. Now look at verse number 4. And they said, Go to, let us build a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make a name, lest we be scattered abroad the face of the whole earth. Let us for ourselves build a city. This, if you like, was going to be their commercial uh, coming together. And they also were going to build a tower. Notice what it says about this tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. You'll notice that, that the words unto are, are in italics. It just it really says, who's top heaven. It's top heaven. Rather than worshiping the God who made the sun and the moon and the stars, they were, began to worship the sun, the moon, and the stars. Indeed, this is the beginning of the zodiac system. Uh, and anyone who reads their horoscope, and I hope you don't, but this is where it began in Babylon. If you look at Wikipedia, it'll tell you it traces the roots of the zodiac right back into Babylon just here in Genesis chapter 11. And so they began to worship the sun rather than the God who made the sun. You can see they're coming together commercially, and they're coming together uh, religiously, uh, and they've decided that they're going to do things for themselves. Now, look at verse number 4 again. And they said, Go to, let us build a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name. They're looking at a name. They're filled with self-importance. And you see the reason at the end of verse number 4. Lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Now, what did God say He wanted them to do? God said He wanted them to repopulate and replenish the earth. And you can see they're going against the plan of God, and they're going against the will of God. This is in direct defiance to God. This is man's attempt at one world governance. This is man's attempt at globalization. This is a God-defying government. Let me say this. When you see globalization, you'll discover it is no time for God, and it is no time for the Word of God. This is what Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 12. And because iniquity shall abound, and we know indeed that iniquity is abounding, it says, the love of many shall wax cold. And I, I believe right at the heart of that is the love of men for God will wax cold. And you see the word iniquity. It means lawlessness. And it's not just breaking the law. It's breaking the law of God. That's what Jesus said it would be like in the end times. There's going to be coldness. There's going to be lawlessness, if you like. And when you find this one world government, you, you discover that by and large, they're, they're anti-God and they're anti the Word of God. You know that some of the countries in Africa, many of them still want to hold to the Word of God. You'll discover the Anglican church, for instance, in Africa, uh, are determined to stick to the Word of God. They don't want to compromise in the Word of God. And many of these nations don't want to compromise in the Word of God. Great pressure is brought upon them by, by the G20, by the G8, that they may conform, that they may have more liberal laws. Uh, and they're saying, we'll withhold funding if you don't change your laws. You can see how global governance works. Pressure is put on other people that if they don't conform to what they think is right, then they're really uh, going to cut off funding, and they're really going to make them pay for it. 
And we see it in, in large scales. We see it in some small-scale activity. This is what's happening here in Genesis chapter 11. Man is really shaking his fist in the face of God. And they said, we, we want to be together, and we want to have our own government, and we want to run the show. That's not what God wanted. What was God going to do? Look at verse number 11. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one. They have all one language, and this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them uh, which they have imagined to do. They're speaking with one voice. They're speaking unitedly in defiance of God. And the Lord says, Nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Evil will know no bounds, and every man will do that which is right in his own eyes. That's what's going to happen. So what's God going to do? Look at verse 7. Go to, the Lord says. Let us, notice the us there. You see, God's a trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from tents upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Notice the plurality, as I said, a trinity. God stepped in. And God had stepped in in the past. He stepped in with a flood in the days of Noah. He stepped in in Sodom and Gomorrah. We'll discover that in Genesis 19. And here God steps in. And God says, enough's enough. And he confounds their languages and they're scattered abroad upon the face of the earth. That's why in Genesis 10, you find them in different places with different languages and different countries. But Genesis 11 tells you what happens before that came to be. You can see this is man's attempt at globalization to come together that the world may be a smaller place. Look at verse number 9. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Babel means confusion. We talk sometimes about children babbling. That's where the word comes from. And God confused their language, gave them different languages, and they spread out according to the languages. That's the tar tonight. I just wanted to show you, way back from Genesis, man's attempt at globalization. Man's attempt that the world would be seen as one place uh, and ruled by one person, if you like, uh, and they would all have one economic policy, they'd have one religious policy, uh, and that's the root of it in Genesis chapter 11. God stepped in and God scattered them. Now I want to roll the clock forward tonight. And I want to go beyond and come into the book of the Revelation. I want you not only to see the tower, I want you to see the tyrant tonight. What does this mean prophetically tonight? I believe the clock has moved full circle. I believe we're now back in these days where we have this global government, where you have the global village where you have the world as a smaller place, where you have the G8 and the G20 and, and all these leaders want to speak on behalf of the world and set policy for the whole world. Globalization is, is no longer popular with everyone. Many people are annoyed because they've seen jobs uh, taken from parts of the United States and transferred out to India. We have seen jobs in Northern Ireland. Uh, our textile industry go from here over to the Far East because the world's such a small place now such a small place. And there's some kickback against globalization. Some people say in the press are saying that the presidential election in the United States, and I don't think you get two worst candidates, no matter where you look, some say it's a vote between globalization and nationalization. And some believe that's what it is. And there's a kickback from some of the people because they've seen their jobs being exported to other countries because the world's such a small place. But you see the tar here. I want you to see the tyrant. What does it mean that the world is a smaller place? What does it mean prophetically? See, there's a man coming on this scene of time, a man that we know as Antichrist. And Antichrist is going to rule the world economically. He's going to rule the world religiously. He's going to rule the world militarily. He's going to rule the world politically. And in order to do that, the world needs to be a small place for one man to do this. I believe the stage has been set for Antichrist. And as the world becomes a smaller place, it's ready for a man to come and to get up with the scruff of the neck, to sort out the problems, and if he sorts out the problems, the whole world's going to worship him. Now let's see it in Revelation chapter 13. Look at verse number 4. Revelation 13, verse number 4.
Revelation 13, verse 4. And they worship the dragon. Now, the dragon is Satan, which gave power unto the beast. This is Antichrist. And they worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things. You'll read the same expression in Daniel chapter 7. And blasphemies and power was given unto him forty and two months, three and a half years. No one is the great tribulation. The tribulation lasts for seven years. Great tribulation period when, when the wrath of God will be poured out uh, to the greater extent is known as the great tribulation and will last for three and a half years. What you read, who you read about in verse 4 and 5 is Antichrist. Now just look up the chapter to verse number 3. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. Remember, he's Antichrist. If he wants to be taken seriously, remember he's going to claim to be Christ. He's going to need a resurrection. And so you're going to have a mock resurrection. And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and the deadly wound was healed. Somehow it's going to appear that he's going to die. He's going to rise again. And look what it says in verse 3. The whole world wandered after the beast. Do you see globalization? Do you see the whole world wandering after Antichrist? He needs the world to be a smaller place for this to happen. Now look at verse 8, Revelation 13. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Do you see worldwide worship of Antichrist? He's going to control the world religiously. He's going to control the world economically. Look down to verse 16. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, that no man might buy or sell, save that he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. I'm not going into the three sexes tonight, but you can see that Antichrist will rule the world economically. No one can buy and no one can sell unless they have his say-so. You see, when the world becomes a smaller place, when we have these establishments, the, this Bilderberg group, when we have G8s and G20s, when we have the United Nations, when we have all these global organizations, the scene is being set for someone to come and to rule the world. And it's going to be Antichrist. And you can see it from Revelation chapter 13. Turn over to Revelation chapter 17. You can see Antichrist will rule the world economically. We see it spelled out again here in Revelation chapter 17. Revelation 17 is mystery Babylon. Here is Antichrist ruling the world religiously. I haven't time to go into all these details tonight. Uh, there's a sermon on this alone, indeed many sermons. Look at Revelation 17, 13. And so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was a red and purple and scarlet color. Here's this woman, and she's sitting on the beast, her and Antichrist, if you like, and I, and I say it reverently tonight, they're in bed together. They're in tandem together. Verse 5, And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great. You see the connection with Babylon, the mother of harlots, the abomination of the earth. Let me say that this mystery woman, this whore of Babylon, she, she represents all the religions of the world. And so I believe in the end times there's going to be a coming together of all the false churches. Remember, Jesus Christ is coming to take the true church home. But there'll be a church left on the earth. It'll be a false church. And when you see moves among the ecumenical movement, not only to bring in uh, the Church of Rome and to bring in other uh, Protestant denominations, if I can use that word loosely this evening. You see, they're trying to bring in Islam and many other religions and all the isms you can think of uh, throughout the world. And they're coming together because Antichrist needs them to come together that he may rule the world religiously. And this whore represents all of these isms coming together, whether it's Islam or, or Catholicism or, or, or dead Protestantism, whatever it happens to be. And you can see that Antichrist and this woman are in it together. But I want you to see, notice this, where this woman's sitting. Look at verse number one. I say, I haven't time to get into all the details tonight in chapter 17. 
And there came one of the seven angels, which had seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show thee the judgment of the great whore, that's this woman, that sitteth upon many waters. Now, yet the phrase, sitteth upon many waters. What does that mean? Well, let's find out what the Bible says. Look at verse number 15. And he said unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. You see, worldwide influence. And so Antichrist will have worldwide influence religiously, politically, economically. If you wanted, you could look into chapter 18 because there you have commercial Babylon. In Revelation 17, it's mystery Babylon. In Revelation 18, I believe it's a literal rebuilt Babylon from where Antichrist will rule the world economically. Look at verse number 3 uh, just for a few seconds. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth, see that word merchants? It's the English word emporium, it's wholesalers. And I believe the, the, the Bible envisaged the, the death of the corner shop. And I believe the Bible envisaged in end times you would have these global brands coming into the United Kingdom, these global brands obviously throughout the world. Uh, and we were doing our shopping in these big wholesale places, uh, and I believe we see it here. Well, you see, Antichrist is going to control all of this. The financial Babylon will be the financial capital of the world, and from there he'll control the world economically. For that to happen, the world has to be a small place. We need this global governance to be in place. We need the scene to be set for him. And I believe we see these things happening before our eyes. Thomas Ice, Dr. Thomas Ice writes this. We see the urge for globalism in at least the following areas. Government, economics, religion, the environment, the military, commerce, trade, manufacturing, banking, business, population control, education, management, publishing, entertainment, personal health and well-being, wealth redistribution, agriculture, law, science, medicine, sports, travel, music, electronics, the internet, and information availability, and in so many different areas. And this is what he goes on to say, and I'm leaving a little bit out. Thus, current moves toward globalization are preparation for Antichrist, not for Jesus Christ. And the scene has been prepared for Antichrist to come. You see the tar tonight. You see the tyrant tonight. Let me say something thirdly about terrorism tonight. Because we've had, we have a phenomenon now, and we're no strangers to terrorism in Northern Ireland. But there's a phenomenon tonight known as global terrorism. Do you ever remember a time when, when terrorism is so widespread in so many different countries in so many different places? Attacks in France, attacks in Germany, attacks in the United States, attacks in the United Kingdom. You go into the Middle East and it's nearly a daily occurrence. You get into some of the African countries. No matter where you go in the world, there, there seems to be a, a, a rising of, of violence in the world, a rising of terrorism. Uh, and we're in the days of global terrorism. Even the Pope himself said it's a global war. And many of the presidents of the United States and prime ministers talk about a, a global war on terrorism. There's global terrorism in the world. Globalization has made it possible. Globalization has made it possible for terrorists to move freely. Globalization has made it possible for a terrorist attack that's carried out in one part of the world to be flashed across the media instantaneously, and someone who goes into a place with a suicide bomb or with a weapon to kill people is on news at 10 throughout the world. And globalization has made it possible. What did the Lord Jesus Christ say? In Luke chapter 17, verse number 26, we read this. Jesus says, As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. And the Lord Jesus talks about the days of Noah, and he says, The days of the Son of Man, in other words, when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, there's going to be similarities between the days of Noah and the days of the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. And there are many things that we could look at. 
You could read Genesis chapter 4 through to Genesis chapter 6, and you'll see many things that will amaze you, things that were happening in the days of Noah that are happening today. One of the things that the days of Noah is known for is their, of course, their ungodliness. Genesis 6 verse 5. If you want to read about the days of Noah, you go to Genesis chapter 6. And this is what it says in Genesis 6 verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And because uh, that man was so evil, God stepped in and God had to destroy the world. This is what he said in verse 13 of Genesis 6. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence. Have we ever known a time when the earth has been so filled with violence? You know, 2014, and again, this is what records go up to, was the deadliest year for terrorist attacks and for fatalities. 32,658 people lost their lives in terrorist attacks throughout the world. That's the ones we know about. The year before, it was 18,000. If you go back to the year 2000, it was 3,300. It's a ninefold increase over a 14 year period. And violence is right throughout the world. In 2014, the cost of global terrorism was $52.9 billion. That doesn't count the $114 billion that were spent on global terrorism counter global terrorism. How the world would love someone to come and solve that problem. You know, from the year 2000 to the year 2014, 140,000 people have lost their lives because of global terrorism. Something similar to what the atomic bomb did in Hiroshima. We're living in a days when the earth is filled with violence. We have the global terrorist and we have global terrorism. And globalization has made it possible. And the Lord Jesus Christ says that that's what it was like in the days of Noah. That's what it's going to be like when I come back again. And so when I look at the tar and I see man's attempt at globalization and how God stepped in, and now I see man again attempting globalization, I believe God's going to have to step in. I believe the scene has been set for Antichrist. I believe global terrorism uh, would tell us tonight, indeed, that Jesus Christ is coming, and He's coming soon. We see we've looked at the tar tonight. We've looked at the tyrant tonight. We've looked at ter terrorism tonight. But I want to talk about truth tonight as I bring this meeting to a close. What's it mean to you and I tonight? What does this all mean? I want to mention three things. I want to talk, first of all, about separation. The Lord Jesus said in Luke 12, verse 51, Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth. I tell you nay, but rather division. For from henceforth there shall be five in one house divided, three against two and two against three. And then the Lord went on to say, The father shall be divided against the son, the son against the father, the mother against the daughter, the daughter against the mother, the mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And the Lord spoke about a division. What's causing the division? It's those who belong to Christ and those who don't belong to Christ. He said there's going to be a division in the world, and of course that division uh, was with us then and it's with us tonight. But I believe it reminds us tonight that there's a division. There's those who are saved and there's those who are lost. And I think there's a challenge to the believer tonight. We live in the age of globalization when everyone goes with the flow. God's looking for men and women and young people who will stand up and stand for Christ, who won't be conformed to this old world, but will be transformed by the renewing of their mind. Peter reminds us in 1 Peter 1 verse 1 that we're strangers. Paul reminds us in Titus 2 verse 14 that we are a peculiar people. We're strangers. We're a peculiar people. And I believe there's a world out there that speaks with one voice, and God's looking for His people to stand up and speak for Him and say, I'm not ashamed to own my Lord or to defend His cause. Looking for people to stand in the workplace, to stand in the home, to stand in the community, indeed to stand 
against this globalization and say we belong to Christ. And we're not going with the flow. The Lord said, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. In the days of Ezekiel, we read this. God says, I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand on the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. And the Lord was looking for people in Ezekiel's day and he couldn't find them. And I believe the Lord's looking for people today to stand up and not to go with the world, but to stand up for Christ. There's a challenge about separation. I believe there's a challenge about evangelization too. We live in a, in a small world. It's easier to travel now. It's easier to reach the, the world. It's easy to reach the world through, through the technology we have, through, through internet. Uh, it's much easier to travel. Uh, what an opportunity to reach many with the gospel. What an opportunity. What a day and age in which we're living. I'm sure it's the same in Kilkeel, back in, over in Rafael. During the summer, we had young people in Brazil, in the United States, in, in Spain, in Portugal, in Uganda, uh, and and lots and lots of countries. When I was a young person, that just wouldn't have been possible. And the ease of travel, it's much easier now to get into different places with the gospel. Let's use it. Let's take the opportunities. Let's not hold back and reach in the world with the gospel. Yes, I believe globalization is not of the Lord, but I believe we can use these things to spread the good news of the gospel. The Lord Jesus said, But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. I believe when we think of globalization, there's a challenge tonight about separation for you and I to be different, to be different in the world. I believe there's a challenge about evangelization. The world is before you. Don't waste the opportunities. I believe there's a challenge about preparation. Because I believe when we see the world becoming a smaller place, when we see this global village that we hear so much about and global governments, I believe Jesus is coming and he's coming soon. You see, if the stage has been set for Antichrist, before Antichrist comes, Christ will come. Before the man of sin comes, the sinless man's coming. And Jesus Christ could come tonight and he could come at any moment. And when we see all these things around us begin to happen, the Lord says, look up, look up. Surely the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. And maybe you're in the meeting tonight and you're not seeing. And you're not ready tonight. This is a challenge about preparation tonight, to be ready that when the roll is called up yonder, you'll be there. Don't miss out. Don't get left behind. The Lord's surely speaking tonight and surely speaking through the events that's happening in the world. I I was reading on the 25th of July, news got out in Sydney that one of these Pokemon, one of the ones that were much sought after, no idea why people would go after it. Apparently hundreds of people came out to try and find this thing in the middle of the night. Same thing happened in Central Park in the United States. People flocked looking for this fictitious character. Remember, they're only fictitious. The Lord Jesus Christ is no fictitious character. He is really coming, and I believe he's really coming soon. And there's a crowd on the broad way that's leading to destruction. And the Lord's looking you to be on the narrow way which leadeth unto life, that you might be ready when Jesus comes. If you're not saved tonight, what a night to get saved. Now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Tomorrow night we're going to look at anti-Semitism. And as we see the rise in anti-Semitism, I believe again is telling us that our Lord's coming. Let's bow in a moment's prayer.